Okay, thank you very much for joining us for this Kirby Institute seminar, which is on the topic of a scale up of point of care testing for hepatitis C, <clears throat> which I think is going to become a key element of the forward plan for elimination efforts. Um, my name's Andrew Lloyd, and I'm an infectious diseases physician and researcher based here at the Kirby. And I have a particular interest in hepatitis services in the prison sector. For this seminar, however, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're gathered today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the Bidjigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the Kirby Institute stands. And we pay our respects to those elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be joining this seminar today. First of all, just a couple of housekeeping items to familiarize you with the, the format for the seminar. So we're gonna start off with three relatively brief presentations that'll take up approximately 30 minutes or a bit over, followed by a Q&A session with uh, the panel, the three speakers and, and three additional panel members that I'll, I'll introduce. <clears throat> you can ask questions throughout the program at any point by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be addressing those questions in the panel session in particular. And I'll, I'll try and point to the various panel members to the, to the questions that you've posed. So to move straight on to the program, therefore, my, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Yumi Sheehan, and she's a project officer and a PhD student in the Viral Immunology Systems Program here in the Kirby. She's currently not only doing her PhD, but also managing multiple research studies with a focus on enhancing access to testing and treatment for people in prison, in particular in the study that she's going to talk about, the PIVOT study, but also the National Prisons Hepatitis Education Project and the OzHep Surveillance Study. So please welcome Shumi to start the ball rolling. Thanks, Shumi. All right, I think I'm all good to go. So my name is Yumi Sheehan, um, and I will be presenting some of the findings from the PIVOT study today. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of the broader PIVOT team. So the PIVOT study is a one-stop shop intervention that integrates uh, point of care HCV RNA testing to enhance hepatitis C testing and treatment uptake among new receptions to prison. I have no personal disclosures. So Australia is on track to achieve the WHO targets to eliminate hepatitis C as a public health threat by 2030. And a huge facilitator of this was the listing of the highly effective, tolerable and short course direct acting antiviral therapies um, or DAAs on the ph pharmaceuticals benefits schemes and availability of the therapies to all Australians, um, including those people who are incarcerated in prisons. And since their listing on the PBS in 2016, we've done quite well at identifying uh, and treating a high number of individuals. But as you can see in this figure here on my screen, um, which I've taken from the recently released uh, Curb Institute monitoring report from 2020, uh, which shows the number of individuals who are initiating treatment or who initiated treatment from 2016 uh, through to the end of last year. Um, we can see that the treatment initiations are on a downward trend uh, and we need to continue to actively case find and test and treat all those with HCV, in particular amongst high risk um, populations such as injecting drug users. Because of the high rates of drug related incarceration, there's also a high rate, um, high rates of injecting drug use happening in the prisons and there's also high chronic HCV prevalence in the prisons. Uh, in Australia, this is at around 10 to 15%. So this makes prisons really great venues to focus testing and treatment efforts. Um, in Australia, they've actually been considered as priority settings uh, in the national elimination strategy. So taking a look at uh, the, the national total treatment initiations in 2016 and in 2019. So in 2016, um, all treatment of, of all treatment uh, initiations that happened nationally, 6% um, actually happened in the prisons. And by 2019, this proportion had actually increased uh, to 29% and is anticipated to increase again in 2020. But this still only represents a portion of people with HCV and who are eligible for treatment um, actually initiating treatment in the prison. 
So as you can see, there's a growing importance for prisons in national elimination, given the growing contribution to national totals. Uh, but further strategies are needed to continue to engage those individuals uh, with testing and treatment in the setting. So prisons are a unique physical structure, um, generally with a lot of overcrowding and they're complex and challenging environments and that's um, socially, physically and psychologically. And there's a lot of movement uh, happening in the prison setting with lots of people coming in and out of prison or transferring between different pr prisons and most people are generally only in for a short period of time. So the high prevalence and the frequent movements kind of coupled with the limited nursing capacity um, and other competing priorities means that there are challenges to people in prison efficiently making their way through the hepatitis care cascade and making their way onto treatment. So reception prisons, um, they're prisons that are taking those who are just coming into prison from the community. Uh, they generally have a high turnover and high throughput, um, ranging from around 20 new receptions per week all the way up to 20 per day. And the prison reception period provides a great opportunity to capture a high number of people for testing and treatment just as they're coming into the prison system. So this is an example um, of a typical pathway that someone takes when they come into prison. Um, there is some variation, but this is uh, a pretty typical pathway. So the pathway generally involves consultations with several different healthcare providers, so maybe nurses, GPs or specialists. And in general, it can take a long time, sometimes several weeks or months, for people to move through the pathway to treatment initiation. So firstly, the, um, people will come in and they'll have a reception interview within 48 hours of incarceration. So this is largely an opportunity to screen for suicide risk, um, drug withdrawal and other high risk conditions. Um, and in the context of bloodborne viruses, this is where nurses provide referrals for bloodborne virus or STI screening. Uh, for those deemed at heightened risk, um, such as injecting drug users. Reception is generally a highly stressful and highly turbulent time for prisoners. So next, and at a separate time point, um, they may go on to have bloodborne virus and STI screening. Um, this is where the HCV antibody pathology is taken. If antibody positive, they then may go on to have a further clinical assessment um, and pathology taken for HCV RNA. Again, at a separate time point and with a different nurse. Following on from that, they may have some other clinical assessments um, and then a specialist consultation for treatment suitability with a view to DA prescription and thence treatment initiation. Again, all of which may happen at separate time points and in separate visits. So as you can see, there's ample opportunity for dropping off the care cascade, uh, essentially at any time point throughout this journey. So as you can imagine, the less steps in the care cascade there are, the more opportunity for retention. And this really highlights the need for improved efficiencies um, or streamlining of the care cascade. So the advent um, of Cepheid's expert HCV viral load finger stick assay uh, potentially provides a really great opportunity for improved efficiencies in the hepatitis care cascade in various settings, uh, in particular for reception prisons where there's a high pretest probability given the high prevalence, um, as well as high throughput. So with the point of care test, um, all that's required is a, a small blood sample is taken from a finger prick um, and deposited into a cartridge, which is then placed into the expert machine. Um, and you can run several tests at once um, if it is a multiple cartridge machine. And the assay provides a quantifiable HCV RNA result in 60 minutes. And this opens up the opportunity for a single visit diagnosis and brings us one step closer to a single visit test and treat. So the assay has very high sensitivity and specificity and is comparable with traditional lab tests. So there are some, a small number of requirements um, for, for the point of care testing, but generally all that's required um, is the, the laptop that comes with the machine, as you can see here on the far right, um, some of the regular consumables and disposables and a workspace with a sharp spoon. So the primary objective of the PIVOT study um, was to evaluate a one-stop shop intervention, integrating point of care, HCV, RNA testing, fibro scan, clinical assessment, and fast track DA prescription on treatment uptake among people recently incarcerated. The primary endpoint of the study was treatment initiation at 12 weeks from enrollment. And a couple of the secondary objectives um, that I'll talk about today is to compare the proportion of people tested for HCV prior to and following the intervention and to compare the time taken from enrollment to each step in the care cascade. 
So the pivot study was conducted uh, at Mid North Coast Correctional Center, which there's a photo of just here on my screen, uh, which is a reception prison up on the Mid North Coast of New South Wales. All newly incarcerated adult males, um, so those who have been incarcerated within the previous six weeks um, and who had no prior experience with DAA treatments were eligible for inclusion. Um, those with HPV co-infection or with an invalid fibroscan result um, or evidence of cirrhosis were excluded from initiating treatment through the study. So the PIVOT um, study was a historically controlled before and after study uh, with a control and an intervention phase. So in the control phase, which uh, enrolled participants from 2019 to May 2000, October 2019 to May 2020, Participants were enrolled and underwent uh, a nurse-led interview style survey. Uh, and then they were just observed as they made their way through the st standard of care cascade for testing and treatment. Uh, and we'll report the number of patients initiated on treatment through the standard of care. In the intervention phase, which uh, enrolled participants from June 2020 to April this year, um, participants were enrolled and underwent the one-stop shop intervention. Uh, for those who were RNA positive, um, they were initiated on treatment through the study uh, and then followed up at, at end of treatment and SVR12 with another point of care um, RNA test uh, to determine cure. And again, we'll report the number of patients initiated on treatment through the intervention. So taking a closer look at what's involved in this one-stop shop intervention. So the one-stop shop combines all key assessments for HCV into a single nurse-led visit. So participants in the one-stop shop had a point of care HCV RNA test using that expert finger stick assay, a fibro scan to assess for liver disease, um, a clinical assessment and a nurse led interview style survey, all in the same 60 minute visit. Those who are RNA positive from the point of care test um, had fast track prescription for Maverick, which is a pangenotypic DAA um, from a specialist via telehealth, which usually happens same day and fast track treatment and treatment initiation, which again, generally happen with a cut within a couple to a few days. Uh, we did have a, a, a nice arrangement or a special arrangement with the Central Justice Health Pharmacy, which is down in Sydney um, for priority dispensing, which was great, um, but it did take um, some time for the drugs to make their way from Sydney up to Kempsey on the mid North Coast. We were also fortunate enough um, to have a dedicated clinic space at the prison, um, as well as funding for a dedicated correctional officer to escort the prisoners uh, to and from the clinics and, this, and their pods. Um, and as the machine is portable, uh, when COVID hit, our nurse actually adapted by taking the machine and uh, conducting all the one-stop shop assessments um, out to the pods of the wings, uh, which helped with limiting prison uh, movements uh, within the prison. So some of the results are from the pivot study. Uh, so I'll be showing you throughput um, in the standard of care and the intervention and the testing and treatment uptake. Um, versus the one-stop shop intervention. So the participant characteristics were comparable across the two phases. Um, and it's important to note that the study um, was conducted at a prison that's actually considered to be pretty good. Um, so the one that has reasonably good hepatitis service delivery in the standard of care. So in this control phase, um, the first 240 people who were enrolled in the study uh, and enrollment happened shortly after reception were observed as they made their way um, along the standard of care pathway. So of the 240 that were enrolled, 43 had hepatitis C testing of whom 19 were found to be RNA positive and five were initiated on treatment. And it took a median of 90 days uh, for um, individuals to make it um, onto treatment. So the next in the intervention period, um, the next 300, uh, pe 301 people who were enrolled in the study, uh, and again, uh, enrollment happened shortly after reception, um, had testing and treatment through the one-stop shop intervention. So of the 301 uh, participants, 298 uh, had point of care RNA testing of whom 30 were found to be RNA positive and 28 initiated on, tre on treatment. And it took a median of six days for these individuals to make it onto treatment. So as you can see, um, there's a dramatic, in oh, where have I gone? Sorry. There we are. Uh, so as you can see, there's a dramatic increase in both uh, testing uptake from 18% uh, to 99% and treatment uptake from 26% to 93% in the one-stop shop intervention versus the standard of care. And time to treatment initiation was also markedly reduced from a median of 90 days to six days. So a couple of points for consideration. 
Um, as mentioned, a huge facilitator of the success of the study was having funding for a dedicated research nurse and a correctional officer, as well as a dedicated clinic space at the prison. We're also currently undertaking a cost effectiveness analysis um, to compare the costings in the one-stop shop model and the standard of care. Um, and there are a couple of other prison-based projects that we're aware of that are utilizing uh, point of care HCV RNA testing, but all that have slightly different models than our one-stop shop intervention. So there is the um, point of care testing project, which is being led by Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network in New South Wales, uh, which is being conducted at um, a prison out at Silverwater, which is a high throughput reception prison in metropolitan New South Wales. There's also the PROMPT study, uh, which is being led by AC Australia and South, South Australia Health, um, which uh, is being conducted down in South Australia, metropolitan South Australia. And there's also uh, the rapid test and treat program in a UK women's prison. Uh, which was looking to redesign the diagnosis and treatment pathway um, in uh, so which was employing a model that had opt-out uh, rapid testing on entry to prison and fast track tangent into the big ther therapy now this study in the uk showed comparable treatment uptake to the pivot study uh, but again had a slightly different model than the one-stop shop intervention uh, and not all participants in this study underwent uh, testing via the point of care rna test and the findings from these studies i believe are yet to be published um, there's also interest from prisons around the country um, in Australia in point of care testing, and some are already exploring the utility of point of care testing. Um, so there are a couple of prisons up in Queensland who have done point of care testing blitzes recently. Uh, and the pivot model, um, so this one-stop shop model is actually the winner of, a, um, of the Australia and New Zealand region of an international um, model of care competition. Uh, and there's an infographic coming soon. So in conclusion, uh, so the pivot study showed that the one-stop shop intervention that integrates point of care RNA testing, enhanced testing and treatment uptake, and markedly reduced time and increased efficiencies for treatment initiation, and thereby overcoming key, by, key barriers to treatment scale up in the prison sector. And looking forward, I guess scaling up point of care testing prisons uh, more broadly across the country will be really good for national elimination. So a few acknowledgements. Um, we would like to acknowledge all of the participants and collaborators involved in the study. Uh, in particular, we'd like to acknowledge the strong collaboration between um, the Kirby Institute and Justice Health Forensic Mental Health Network, which allows for a lot of work to be happening in the space in New South Wales. I'd also like to spend, send a special acknowledgement to our wonderful research nurse, uh, Amanda Cochran, who did such a fantastic job at leading the, the study on the ground. Um, and also um, for our funders, our study funders, ABB and the NHMRC. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yumi. That's great. You've set the scene wonderfully for the subsequent uh, talks and, and discussion. I'm going to move straight on now um, to invite Lise Lafferty to present next. Lise is a research fellow, postdoctoral research fellow with a joint appointment across the Centre for Social Research here at UNSW, Social Research in Health, and also at the Kirby. And her research particularly focuses on people who inject drugs, including those in the prison and in the community and bloodborne viruses, sexual health and Aboriginal health. Thank you so much, Lise. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to start off um, by paying my respects to and acknowledging the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, the land on which I am presenting on today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, so I'm talking about the pivot study. It's a qualitative sub-study um, based on what uh, Yumi was just talking about. Um, my screen is not. There we go. So just some acknowledgements, obviously, um, the pivot study stakeholders. This qualitative sub-study was funded by the Rapid Point of Care Research Consortium for Infectious Disease in the Asia Pacific. I'd definitely like to thank all of the research participants. Uh, this, in, this study was with people in prison um, and the wonderful Amanda Cochran, who you may just acknowledge, she also did all of the interviews for this study, which was a huge help. So reiterating a lot of what Yumi explained, um, 
people entering into the prison setting have a range of barriers to accessing health, both within prison and in the community. But they've, we've repeatedly heard that accessing health within the prison setting is far easier than accessing healthcare in the community, particularly for hepatitis C care. As Yumi outlined, there's a number of treatment appointments and pathology visits that have to happen across a, a range of a time, a number, a long time, a, a number of visits. Um, which can be quite challenging for people in the community who are engaged in the justice system and have, may have competing other priorities with corrections um, and, and their care in the community. So people have identified the prison health setting as, as offering its own sort of one-stop shop in that if you go to your nurse or go to the doctor there, it's the one health clinic. If you go for pathology, it's the same health clinic. You're not traipsing across town. Um, so it's in itself, it's naturally a one-stop shop. And then within the pivot study, the one-stop shop encompassed, as Yumi identified, the, um, the RNA testing, point of care, finger stick RNA testing, fiber scan, clinical assessments, and fast track DAI prescription, which just significantly reduced that time for people. Um, so Amanda did semi-structured interviews with 24 people in prison eligibility was that they had all participated in the intervention arm that Yumi described. So they had all undergone the um, point of care finger stick testing. And so just to explain here, we, we really wanted to get a range of experiences of people. So people who had a history of injecting drug use, people who had a history of, of venipuncture hepatitis C testing versus people who had never been tested for hepatitis C, but may have deemed themselves as high risk, had avoided coming forward for testing for a range of reasons. Um, so as you can see from, from this little table that there's there's a range of experiences involved. Um, and as, as goes with, I think, every research project I've read that there was that sort of goofy thing that a couple of people had come forward who had never experienced venipuncture, hep C testing. They came forward, did the point of care testing with Amanda. As time went by, they came back for a qualitative interview. And then for whatever reason, they'd also experienced venipuncture between the one-stop shop intervention and the qualitative interview. So they did end up with a bit of perspective. Um, so looking at this, um, at this research, we looked at, we wanted to understand the acceptability of point of care testing for people in prison. And CECOM has done this great framework. It's, it's the first framework that I'm aware of that, that really provides a, a definition of acceptability. And so she describes it as acceptability is a multifaceted construct. And in this instance, it was people receiving a healthcare intervention and whether or not they consider it to be appropriate. So there's seven components of acceptability. And I'll be focusing on the first four, affective attitude, burden, perceived effectiveness, as which is whether or not does the intervention work and self-efficacy, am I able to participate? So affective attitude, I mean, uh, totally unsurprisingly, it was quick, it was easy. Those were the common responses from people. But here, Garth explains it was done straight away and I was able to get onto the treatment straight away, which as Yumi identified was six days compared to three months versus standard care. Um, and here, it's really tricky to see. My video keeps blocking it. But um, so Brendan explains, he explains that systemic issues that happen for people who perhaps cycle in and out of, prison, but also cycle within the prison system. So he got tested here, and this is nine years ago he's done this. I got sent from here down to another prison. They lost my paperwork. We redid the test. He got moved again. Yes, I do have hep C, but we don't know the genotype, so I can't be treated. And then going on for the last six, seven, eight, nine years, and then within the pivot study, it was within the hour. Yes, I did have hep C, and not even a week later, I started the medication. So he really, I think, succinctly captures some of the many benefits and the ways that Pivot has been able to overcome standard barriers to care. With burden, the, the primary theme that came out of the burden component of acceptability was that psychological burden for people. And I think when you think about people who come into prison and they have a whole range of, of different things weighing on their mind as they come in, and this is a reception prison. So these are people who may not know how long they're coming in for, they haven't been sentenced yet. Um, so, so life is just feeling quite overwhelming in that moment. And so then they're coming in and then they're able to find out their results within, within an hour. And so it's quite quick. I wasn't sitting around doing head miles. It plays on your mind whether or not you've got hep C or not. And so then point of care testing is, is able to sort of overcome one of these burdens that people are experiencing as they come into prison. 
Um, trust in healthcare providers and technology perceived effectiveness. So does, does point of care testing work? And I mean, overwhelmingly, yes, people, people thought it worked and for different reasons. And this, this guy explains, because you said it was cool, because Amanda had said, yeah, it works, it's fine. We'll test your blood here, your finger stick blood, it'll be fine. And, and that was enough for some people. Other people just viewed it simply as blood is blood. It's pretty accurate. So it was very straightforward. There wasn't um, much skepticism about whether or not they would get an accurate result. Other people felt like they were pretty confident in what their result was going to be. And so when the result matched their perception of what it was going to be, that was quite significant for them in, in their belief in the result. Um, so self-efficacy, that can I participate? Um, a lot of people, people with and without history of injecting drug use reported a fear of needles. And I think that's probably quite common in the community as well as a barrier to, to different medical interventions. Um, and so this guy, Dwayne explains fear of needles. I would have been pretty scared to do it with, without it been a standard needle. And at least one participant explained that they had never been tested for hepatitis B previously because they were so afraid of the needle. And so by doing the finger stick, it just allowed them to just come forward and go, okay, yeah, let's do this. And it, it took away all that, that fear. Um, and for other people with a history of injecting drug use, the venous access, and we've, we've heard this within the community as well, um, and Marcus explains, you know, if you do have trouble finding veins, people would not go out and get a blood test. They're thinking about their concern for hep C. If it means stuffing around for half an hour trying to find a vein, people just aren't going to do it. And I think that that really captures the ways in which finger stick point of care testing just makes it much easier for people to come forward and find out their results. Um, and people talked about a sense of empowerment as well and being able to find out those results to be able to, to participate and have that self-efficacy of coming forward and going, yep, yeah, I can do this, previous barriers no longer apply. And, and having, as they came into prison and having those results so quickly and having, um, not having to be concerned about whether or not, knowing their status, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, when they came in and so that they could self-monitor during their, their incarceration. Um, so general perceptions of point of care acceptability was that someday RNA testing and results reduced systemic barriers. So the prison system was no longer itself an issue for people being able to find the, the results and commence treatment. Um, it reduced the psychological distress among people entering into prison. There were broad levels of trust in the testing process. Um, and that was within the healthcare system, with the technology, with the healthcare provider. Um, definitely a high preference for finger stick testing over venopuncture. And again, that was for people with and without history of injecting drug use. And I, with what Yumi had said that point of care testing can be a strategy for, for national elimination efforts. I mean, really in the prison setting, that's, that's where it, it starts, I think, or where it is targeted. Um, so I think this is really, there's a lot of support for this amongst people in prison. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lise. Uh, that's great. Let's move on now to our third speaker on the same sort of topic, and that's Jason Grebley. Uh, Jason's the head of the Hepatitis C and Drug Use Group within the Viral Hepatitis Clinical Research Program here at the Kirby. And uh, as many of you know, Jason's research and training and focus is on epidemiology, particularly cl clinical epidemiology and particularly in the context of hepatitis C. Uh, thank you, Jason. Great, thanks. I'm assuming you can see not the notes. Great. Yeah, we've got you. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much. Um, it's great. And thanks so much to Yumi and Lise for setting up. Uh, most of the background. So to be honest, I'll just jump right into the sort of meat of things. Uh, just here's my disclosure slide. Um, look, before I begin, I think it's really important just to acknowledge a range of different people who've um, provided sort of input and support into the Tempo pilot study. Um, that includes um, people at the Kirby and UNSW, um, the, the team at, at Kirkton Road Center, and also uh, the, the team at NUA um, who've been really doing a lot of the uh, work on the ground and it, I think it's just really important and just to also acknowledge that this um, is also part of a pilot project through Sphere and uh, through Triple I. 
Um, I, I, look, I think it's quite exciting, uh, some of the discussions that we're having and the fact that the finger stick assay really does bring us towards a, a closer to a single visit test and treat strategy. So we need to sort of understand how best to implement it and what sort of settings. And um, it's great to see some of the, the work on the prisons. But I think that you know, needle and syringe programs also offer another potential uh, setting to expand access to testing and treatment. Um, so the Tempo pilot study was an uh, investigator initiated, uh, UNSW sponsored single center open label trial and uh, recruitment occurred at one needle and syringe program in Sydney at the New South Wales Users and AIDS Association, NSP. Um, people were recruited um, as they were accessing services uh, with the support of a dedicated peer support worker. And I think that's a really a unique aspect to the program, which I'll describe in a little bit. Uh, participants were enrolled between September 2019 and April 2021. And I think it's just important to note that recruitment was halted during COVID between March and July 2020. Um, but essentially, people were tested. Those that were positive had a nursing assessment uh, and then were offered treatment and, and peer-based support. Uh, the inclusion criteria participants had to be greater than 18 years of age. They had to have recently injected in the past month. And for people who are HWRNA positive, um, who are going to commence treatment, they essentially um, had to be eligible to, to initiate either sulfosphavir, valpatosphir, or glucaprosphir, preventosphere. And they also had to be suitable for NSP-based uh, DA treatment delivery. And that was at the opinion of the investigator. Um, and then people with a fiber sand score greater than 12.5 kilopascal were excluded. Um, so 101 participants were um, enrolled into the study. Uh, this just gives an idea of the sort of procedures that happened. So participants were enrolled, consented. They had a finger stick point of care test uh, using the expert HCV viral load finger stick assay. Um, also a dry blood spot uh, sample was taken for research purposes. Uh, participants completed a tablet-based survey um, on computer and then were and it was self-administered and uh, with assistance from the nurse and the peer. And they had a fiber scan and then there's a physician consultation uh, with the nurse via telephone and then peer-based support through treatment. And I'll describe a little bit more about that in a second. So this is the model. So essentially, as I mentioned, there's fiber scan based uh, liver disease assessment. Um, we also offered point of care testing for HIV uh, using the Allaire HIV combo assay um, and also for Hep B using the Allaire Determined 2 HPS antigen assay. Um, there was also arrangements with the local pharmacy in place so that DA dispensing could be provided. And then what happened is that the nurse generally uh, made a phone call to a physician at Kirkton Road to arrange for a script to be, um, to, to be uh, performed. And then what would happen is the pharmacy was emailed for dispensing and then the hard copy was delivered the next day. And medication co-payments were all covered through the study. Um, a unique aspect to the model was a dedicated peer-based support worker. Um, who provided peer-led education and, and engagement, and they really facilitated health promotion and engaged people in the waiting room and, um, and facilitated uh, as people were sort of, um, you know, accessing the service. I think uh, this peer provided a really important bridge between the participants and the, the clinical staff at the service, and really also served to provide expertise and support in the completion of the research survey. Uh, lastly, they, as they, as participants initiated treatment, the, the peer provided support through weekly communication and, and follow up, mostly via sort of telephone. All right, so in terms of the study endpoints, um, the primary endpoint was HCV treatment uptake among people who are HCV RNA positive, and the HCV RNA levels were measured using the expert HCV viral load finger stick assay. Um, and as I mentioned, participants completed a self administered questionnaire with a range of different risk behavior information. So of the 101 enrolled, 31% uh, for female, median age 44. As I mentioned, by inclusion into the study, 100% had injected in the past 30 days, 56% heroin, 80% methamphetamine um, primarily, uh, and 18% had injected greater than or equal to daily in the last um, 30 days. Uh, just, about a, just over a quarter uh, were receiving opioid um, agonist therapy uh, with sort of uh, 67% of those receiving methadone and 33% receiving buprenorphine with or without naloxone. So of the 101 individuals tested, um, 27 were HCV RNA positive, uh, so 27%, and 71% uh, initiated treatment through the study. 
I think it's important to note that there were two individuals who were not eligible for treatment within the study and but ended up getting <clears throat> treated uh, through Kirkton Road Center outside of the, the strict study protocols. So overall, 78% um, initiated treatment uh, through, through the study. So just focusing on the 19 who initiated treatment through the NSP, um, the 40, mean age 44 years, almost two thirds male, um, and all of them had recently injected. Um, seven received cefosporib velpatosphere and 12 received glucacrosphere preventosphere. And of those that initiated treatment, just over 50%, so 53% uh, treatment was initiated in a single visit, 37% uh, initiated treatment the next day, and then um, two people or 11% started treatment more than the next day. Uh, but the median time to treatment initiation was one day. So really by having this model with finger stick point of care RNA testing, fiber scan based disease assessment, HIV point of care and hep B surface antigen testing uh, allowed the need to remove phenopuncture and uh, facilitated a very uh, uh, same visit treatment in the majority of participants. Eight people did not initiate treatment. So two of these were lost to follow up. Two did not have any Medicare um, for reimbursement of medications. One had previous DAA treatment, and that was prior to the protocol being amended to allow that to um, occur. One uh, could not, we didn't, weren't, wasn't possible to obtain an accurate medical history. One was not suitable for treatment due to mental health concerns and um, a liver disease assessment was not able to be performed in one individual. Uh, so this is just in conclusion, um, overall a high treatment uptake was observed uh, following an intervention, including point of care RNA testing same visit treatment and peer-led and nurse-based support. 53% um, initiated on the same day. Um, and I just think it's really important to highlight the peer-based support component because I think it was quite uh, critical in terms of lowering barriers and engaging people and the importance of that peer in terms of improving trust and reducing stigma and discrimination among clients attending the service. And really this peer-based model being embedded within this clinical-based model um, so we're now almost ready to get Tempo, um, uh, the bigger grant uh, going, which is an NHMRC partnership project. Um, overall goals is to enhance HCV testing in primary needle and syringe programs and to develop a translational framework for scaling up dry blood spot testing and point of care testing in, in needle and syringe programs. So it has sort of four major components, uh, clinical effectiveness, so a study, some qualitative research on barriers and facilitators to HCV testing and care led by Carla Trelor and Lisa um, and Alison Marshall, um, some modeling and some health economics um, and that's led by Sophie Shee and Virginia Wiseman and an operator training quality assurance program, which is being developed in collaboration with Flinders University and St. Vincent's. Just briefly, as a step wedge cluster randomized controlled trial. Uh, so 22 needle syringe program sites will be randomized to either immediate implementation of an intervention. So either dry blood spot um, or finger stick point of care RNA testing compared to a uh, standard of care uh, or delayed implementation of the intervention. Uh, so dry blood spot or point of care uh, testing. So I just think um, moving forward, we, I think we really need more data on effectiveness and cost effectiveness of point of care in different settings. It's great to see this pilot data starting to emerge, but we need um, you know, data across a larger range of settings. Um, there are current barriers to reimbursement of point of care RNA testing. It's TGA approved, but um, there's no item number for point of care RNA test um, to be done outside the lab. We need to um, have place infrastructure for operator training, quality assurance, and IT connectivity, and thinking through how we implement that as we move forward and identify and overcome some of these implementation challenges. And I think it's just important to note that we might need different testing strategies for different settings. In particular, in low prevalence settings, we may need to be thinking about point of care antibody testing with then reflex RNA testing. Uh, whereas in high prevalence settings, we could probably go straight in with a finger stick point of care RNA test. All right, I'll close there. Uh, thanks to everyone, in particular, the funders, Sefid and Gilead for the Tempo Pilot and all the people on the work on the ground who did all the hard work. And just to again, acknowledge Sphere for, and Triple I for the funding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jason. And thanks to all the speakers for sticking to time. It's my pleasure now to move into the panel discussion component of our seminar today. Um, so I, I'd like to welcome each of the speakers to join the panel and um, I'll moderate the questions that have come up in the Q&A box.
But first of all, just to introduce the three panelists. Um, the first is Carrie Fowley, who is the CEO of Hepatitis Australia, which she joined about a year ago. But she's got a background of actually decades of peak body experience, focusing really on advocacy for evidence-based policy. That sounds something I uh, true to my heart, as well as public health, social justice, and reconciliation. So welcome, Carrie. Uh, secondly, Stuart Manoj Margison, who's the director of the Bloodborne Viruses, SDIs, and Torres Strait Islander Health Policy Section in the Communicable Diseases Branch of the Commonwealth Department of Health. So directly responsible for a lot of the topic we're talking about today. And thirdly, Alex Thompson. So Professor Alex Thompson from St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne and also University of Melbourne. Alex is a hepatologist, clinical hepatologist and researcher focused in particular on viral hepatitis B and C, in particular in the prison sector because he leads the hepatitis service in the Victorian prisons and other studies in people who inject drugs. So welcome to all of the panelists. I'm going to start the ball rolling, if I may, just by picking up on um, a couple of questions that are pointed towards you, me, from the, uh, uh, from the audience. Um, straightforward, really. What did you do about uh, identifying hepatitis B? Did you do some kind of test like Jason described for, for Tempo? Yeah, for sure. We actually used the same uh, rapid test, uh, the ALEA Determine 2 test um, to uh, identify people actually within that one-stop shop session um, for people who had HBV co-infection. We actually didn't find anyone uh, in the intervention that uh, had HBV co-infection. Thank you so much. And, and maybe staying on that with you, Yumi, just for a moment on the practicalities of point of care testing. It, it, in some ways, it all sounds too good to be true. Is it, is it really as simple as it sounds? Is it, can you always get enough blood? What do you do about the sharps? Is it cumbersome to carry that machine in and out of the prison? How do you, how do, how do you manage the logistics? Yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, everything would run smoothly. But as always, I'm sure in lots of different settings as well, uh, in particular in the prison setting, there are a whole bunch of challenges that, that, that just pop up. Um, so in terms of kind of, I guess, how simple it is to actually take the sample from the finger prick, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, but our research nurse, Amanda, did say that there were a bunch of people who perhaps had rough hands or who had poor circulation, who it was a little bit difficult to get a full sample from them. Um, and it did require on occasion for the um, for, for you know, a second round of, or a second attempt um, at taking that sample. Um, in terms of portability of the machine, uh, my sense is that it's, it's pretty portable. You know, Amanda quickly adapted in COVID and she was able to go out to the pods rather than having all the prisoners come to her in her clinic. So she was able to actually move the machine out to the pods uh, and conduct all of the assessments out there um, safely and, you know, with no harm to the machine. It's, it's, um, it's relatively small. She only had a two cartridge machine. Uh, so you just pack it away in a little box and she just moved it on out to all of the different uh, pods. So no, almost as more, good as it sounds. Almost as good as it sounds. There are a couple of challenges. Um, but. Well, one other small thing, Yumi, um, one of the uh, members of the audience, Megan, was wondering about why people who had past treatment were excluded in PIVOT, previous DAA treatment. So they were excluded, I guess, from the intervention yeah, so they were excluded from the um, from the intervention or treatment through the through the study because we were um, that we were prescribing through the study, uh, which was Maverick. Um, and those with um, prior DA experience or prior treatment experience would have required a little bit more of a complex uh, clinical assessment. Um, so those who who uh, required that kind of that further assessment were um, referred for treatment through the standard of care on through the Justice Health Hepatitis Service. And perhaps a different drug, I guess, perhaps Vosevi rather than Maverick. Perfect. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I've got another question, which might probably best starts with um, Lees. And that is, uh, Lees, I think in your presentation, you focused primarily on the patients, I guess, in this case, the prisoners' perspectives about acceptability. I can picture, though, that in the prison setting, the correctional officers who are in sometimes the in many ways the all powerful beings um, if they don't perceive that this is a good thing then it may not 
actually go ahead. Do, do you know of any data about the correctional officers' perspectives on the utility of point of care? Not yet, but ask me in a couple of weeks after I do <laughs> well, some interviews. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And 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 other and, and from other clinicians, presumably, you know, that would would uh, a drug and alcohol work? I think that it's a good thing to do. You know, with other healthcare providers. I think on a whole, they would see the value in it. Yes. Um, yeah, I think there's. I think there's. I think there's a lot of support within the prison setting to address hepatitis C, um, and it it is a matter of how it gets sales pitched to the different groups within prison, but I think on the whole, there is a lot of support. And so it's about finding the right health messaging. Yeah, for sure. Alex, you've got some direct experience with trialing the point of care testing protocol, I think outside the prison setting. Do you want, do you want to comment on some of those same issues, practicalities, perceptions? Yeah, so yeah, so we have not yet trialed it in the prison. So I'll speak about my experience, was, which was at a safe injecting facility in Melbourne. Um, so a, a high prevalence setting. Uh, the it, it, our pilot program was very successful at dramatically increased testing rates. I, I think um, both Jason and Yumi made the point that it's not just the testing kit, it's also the staff who run the, the, um, the test. And, and that was our experience. We had a full-time research fellow running the program who was there five days a week um, and since the pilot project has completed, uh, testing rates have tailed off a little because there's, um, there isn't that, well, well, there isn't, we're now getting back uh, up and running, but there was a break when there wasn't a dedicated person to run the test. And I think it's really important this machine needs to be paired with someone. Um, the, the finger sticking is straightforward. You can learn to do it within an hour. Um, the, over and our experience with the test was very good. It, it is important that the cartridges are filled, that you get the full 100 microliters, and there is a there's a low failure rate if you don't get, fill the cartridge up with blood, um, and and that's perhaps a, a little different um, to a venipuncture, um, which is which is perhaps more reliable but much more protracted in, and and complicates the cascade of care. Um, so overall, our experience was was very positive. We we also were able to start people on treatment the same day. Um, our experience was that that actually a minority started the same day. That it takes forty five to sixty minutes to get a result, and that the safe injecting facility in, in Victoria at the moment, most clients would be there for less than an hour um, right. outside of this program. Um, but for most clients, we obtained a mobile phone number, and we were able to provide them with their results the same day. Um, and overall, we started about 20% of the clients on treatment same day. Um, the, we had a very high conversion to treatment, though, of the, um, the 65 people who we diagnosed with hepatitis C. We were able to start 92% of them on treatment, and we did that within two weeks. Fantastic. So it does sound, um, panel members, like this is almost too good to be true. Um, and so I'm wondering about... There are a few um, barriers still. I think Jason flagged, you flagged a couple of these in your talk, um, and Alex has sort of alluded to it as well. That is, I guess, the training of the personnel that are going to operate the test and the quality assurance, I guess, of the machine. Do you want to talk us through some of those issues, Jason, and, and then maybe we'll ask others to comment? Sure, Andrew. Yeah, and I look. I think Alex really nailed it as well. I think the person power is really important. The machines just don't run themselves, and I think you really need to have committed healthcare providers or peers um, being able to, you know, provide that support. So I think you need to, you know, dedicate support on the ground. I think the operator training is really important. Again, just. I guess, echoing what Alex said, I think it's really important in terms of the quality assurance program that's in place. Otherwise, we have seen studies that have pretty high error in invalids. Um, but look, that's easily addressable. Um, you know, so I think we can get over that. And then the other thing just to touch on is just around the IT and connectivity. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, I think just it's something that we are working through sorting through, but and, you know, for SDIs and COVID, um, you know, Rebecca Guy and and um, Mark Shepard and Sue Matthews has sorted through this 
um, for, for, for those programs. But yeah, it's just, we need to think through how do we get those results into the patient information systems and then back to the notification units for the public health units to have a sort of streamlined system. But those things are in place. We just need to build them now. That sounds like no mean feat though, Jason, to be honest, because I'm assuming every venue almost has got its own unique electronic pathology or health record. So you're going to connect to all of those? No, it's not cheap, Andrew. Um, I think <laughs> I think we, we need to sort through it. Um, and the beauty is that there are ways of having standardized file formats uh, that labs are used to accepting. So I think getting it to the public health units is actually quite easy. The hard bit, I think, will be sort of custom tailoring it so that every patient information system that that, it, that the results go in in a seam, seamless fashion. So I think that's where there's a little bit more work to bring the IT people together. But I think there's a general willingness from services and different providers to make that happen. So it's all pretty exciting, I think. Okay, can I, can I move the discussion slightly up towards the policy space? Because if I understand correctly, what this test is now doing is moving pathology out of the hands of the pathologists. And that is, from what I know from tr traditional diagnostic practice, that's not a straightforward issue. Partly because, you know, the, the pathologists would like to think that appropriately that they are masters of quality assurance. So is there, is there a precedent for this? Uh, do you want to start, Jason? And then I might ask Stuart to comment about whether the, the politics are going to work okay here. Maybe let Stuart. Stuart, okay, okay. sure, sure. Talk. Yeah, th thank you. Look, I mean, the, I, guess, I guess there's two parts or two, two parts of the answer to this question. And one is the, the regulatory mechanism versus the reimbursement mechanism. Yes. Uh, and, and we've crossed the regulatory bridge with the, the TGA, including this device on the, the list of therapeutic goods that are registered in, in Australia because, because of its sensitive, sensitivity and specificity. Um, so, you know, that with the, the QA component, as long as that's built in, that, that we're going to get results the, the same, as, um, same as pathology. And I think, I think the, the political part from the pathologist comes in where it's more uh, the reimbursement arm rather than the regulatory arm. Uh, and so we don't have precedent yet in terms of listing items on the medical benefits schedule for point of care testing outside of a specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander diabetes program. Um, so M MSAC are currently considering an application for point of care testing for uh, um, STIs. I think there's the three STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia and trichomonas um, that's currently being considered by MSAC, which, which will add then to, to an argument that, that this is worthwhile. Um, but it, it, does, it does propose, a, I guess, a, a policy quandary um, in that it hasn't, it hasn't been done before. It hasn't been done very widely before. And the reimbursement, Stuart, how do we overcome that? Or oh, the, the MBS item will then reimburse that public sector provider to do the test, I guess. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Carrie, can I, can I bring you in here and ask you about how do we, you know, apart from the research that uh, Lise is doing about ensuring that the um, the consumers, the, the pay people who are affected by this disease are supportive of this endeavour. How do we make sure that people living with hep C are sort of front and centre in the rollout of this approach across the country? Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, I, I think one of the things that's so exciting about this is that it's really centering how can we remove barriers and, and what is meaningful to people. And it's really great to see um, social research alongside other uh, components of research working in tandem together. So that's, a, I think, a real strength of this project. And then also to, I think, um, Jason's comments as well about ensuring we've got uh, affected communities as part of the teams doing the work and how do we make sure they are team members and leading and driving a lot of that. So I think what the case studies today have examples of is how to do that well. And so I think one of the challenges will be is how do we replicate this in other mm -hmm. settings and other spaces? And the examples presented today, um, I think are, are, are special in some ways that they have research dollars supporting them. So yeah. there's definitely something about how do we resource this activity 
going forward and making sure we have enough resources to do it in a high quality way, um, but that we don't drop off um, peers and affected communities in the models that we put forward and that we uh, centre that and embed that in the work that we do. Yeah, I think the lessons I've learned from the talks are that um, Alex has flagged the point, you do need a skilled operator. So we need to think about who's going to resource that training and those skills. Um, and uh, Jason, I think, flagged the importance, like you have, Carrie, about the, the key role that peers may play in facilitating the, the uptake of the treatment. I guess those, Stuart would probably say those uh, that infrastructure and making those things happen, that's a state responsibility or is it a Commonwealth responsibility, Stuart? Uh, that, that's, uh, that's a question that's impossible to answer. Um, <laughs> you work it, in it's, partnership. It, it's, a, it's a joint responsibility. And, and I, I, I genuinely believe that, um, that, that we won't be able to do it unless all players are coming to the table um, to contribute to, towards the solution. So yeah, I, I think I think there is some some Commonwealth responsibility in there, but there's there's also some um, some state buy-in needed. Mm. There's a question too from the audience that I, I glossed over slightly. That's kind of relevant here, both for the Commonwealth and the state, and that is about I guess the cost effectiveness of the model. You do want to be it's it sort of it seems intuitive, but you do want to be confident that the whole package, you know, the person power, the peer support workers, the machine, the training, all of that gives you a more cost effective solution than the, the, the traditional approach. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be very interested to see Yumi's results when, when they come out in terms of that cost effectiveness, particularly um, uh, looking at that additional resource requirement of having the, the, um, the dedicated nurse and the dedicated correct, correctional officer. I mean, anything that goes through the um, or that would be be listed on the MBS, I'm confident that it would have gone through a robust cost effective analysis through the the, um, the MSAC process. Um, but it, I think the preliminary results that we get from Yumi will be uh, will be really important. Fantastic. Um, I think we might draw a close there because we've got one minute uh, before finish. If you, if, I, if you wouldn't mind, everybody, just join me in thanking each of the three presenters and our three panel members. It's been a very interesting discussion. I do have the sense that uh, having uh, had DAAs arrive as the great big thing for Hep C, point of care testing may be the second big arrival. We've just got to deliver on the promise of both of those things and reach elimination. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Good on you.